you all. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you for the opportunity. And certainly, I have to thank the, the last two speakers for, uh, for their presentations. Really, it fits quite well. And now I see why they put me in this block you know, to, to present here. So um, yes, my name is Luis Minero. What I want more than anything in this presentation, in these 20 minutes, is to try to give you an idea of the approach that we use at the International Academy of Consciousness in trying to research consciousness, which probably we have a slightly different definition than most people. But uh, doing this research, you know, from the first, second, and third perspective, meaning from I am a subjective participant participative research, so I am a researcher, but also I can teach somebody else to do it, and at the same time, we do the research, you know, a little bit more at a distance of we are investigating something that is separate from us. Yeah, so I want to try to give you this, this model here, and I'm gonna go through several research initiatives that we have. I might not go so much into detail into each one of them, but if you want more information or more data about each one of these initiatives, feel free to ask me afterwards, you know, about them, okay? So uh, first of all, just very briefly, very quickly, because this is going to tie into something afterwards. As Chantal was saying, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to, to research and education. This is our main objective. And we give classes basically all over the world, as you can see here. Uh, and we have already been doing this for over 20 years. Now, uh, something you know that we do is more than anything do research on paranormal phenomena and out-of-party experiences. And one of our main objectives is to try to help people to develop their own skills and to have their own out-of-party experiences. I myself have about uh, 30 years of out-of-party experiences. I actually wrote a book you know, about a couple of years ago trying to summarize all the understanding of out-of-party experiences as much as I could. You know, Obviously, time and space constrict you and limits you, but as much as I could. So, uh, and I forgot to put a slide of the book, so this is why I brought it here to show it. But what we try to do in this, uh, I guess, model is, obviously, in, we have this, I guess, sign everywhere in all of our, you know, uh, institutions and buildings, and I'll show you the research campus in a second, which basically says, don't believe in anything, not even in what we are saying here, but experiment, have your own experiences. And from this, you can already infer several things. First of all, that we are not, can I say, we are not afraid of participative research. We have many times in the out-of-party experiences, in the out-of-party experiences, to be the researcher, to be the guinea pig, so to speak. But at the same time, we don't want to lose our discernment, our logic, our standards, our criteria. So we need, of course, we understand that we need to have, you know, a big pool of experiences so as to try to arrive at consensus and refutation and logic, but not trying to deny because of that our own experiences. So we always keep this you know, on the wall wherever we, wherever we go, wherever we are. Yeah? So that's why we call it, you know, we certainly don't want to believe. We are certainly not an institution that is based on belief, if you understand what I mean by this. Now, um, just very quickly, we have sort of like a research campus in Portugal with many administrative buildings and many different types of laboratories for inducing different paranormal phenomena. Um, this, you know, you can actually see there on our website, but we have, you know, several different laboratories that we call consensual laboratories or laboratories to study the consciousness. But I'll get in a, in a little bit what do I mean, what do we mean by consciousness. Now, um, one of the labs that we have there is this that we call the projectarium or the specialized lab for producing projections outside the body, out of body experiences, unfolding, mystic voyage, etc. Now, um, for those of you maybe that uh, like science fiction movies, if you have seen this movies X Men, you know, this structure that uh, Professor Xavier goes in that is called Cerebro, this will give you a very good idea of how the projectarium looks inside. It's just simply round, empty. There is a plank in the middle instead of a chair with a funny helmet. There is a bed there, and there, is, there are a lot of optimizations, actually, that help people to have their own out-of-body experiences. One of the main things that happens in this lab is that, you know, with the knowledge of informational fields, or maybe trying to associate here other ideas, what uh, Sheldrake would call, you know, a morphogenetic fields, you know, we try to set up that field inside of this uh, lab so as to help people to facilitate so that they can have their own out-of-body experiences. And people describe usually about a 50% increase. This varies from person to person, you know, 
in terms of positive results when they are doing experiments in this lab. I, as I was telling you, have, uh, have been having out-of-party experiences since I was 12, almost 30 years of them. And um, the out-of-party experience is a phenomenon that is almost like a sport. You never bat a, hun a hundred or a thousand, if I'm going to make this baseball analogy. But the more you train, the more you develop, the greater is your batting average. Yeah? But all of the times that I have used a projectarium, I have had a successful out-of-body experience. So my batting average is much higher here than you know when I am at home. But part of the reason why I also present this is because our intention with this lab is to try to understand as much as we can of the variables and of the factors that go into the out-of-body experience so that people don't have to build a projectarium in their own homes, but that they can produce it you know, a little bit more regularly in their bedrooms, you know, which is normally where we are at night, yeah? But moving on here, let me begin, I guess, first of all, by trying to give you the idea of what probably is a little bit easier to understand, you know, the third person perspective, because certainly we do this. The first one I guess I wanna tell you about is about this initiative that we call the projective field. What it is, is we have a ballroom, you know, more or less like this, where 50, 60 people lie down to try techniques for having out-of-body experiences. And they basically have to leave the body, and there is another room in another corner of the hotel w that is completely empty, and we put there a laptop that um, grabs an image at random and just simply displays it there. The room is completely empty, and usually there is an auditor there, somebody not associated with IAC, but uh, a college professor or a journalist, somebody that has a little bit of credibility or authority to a certain extent. So there is this auditor that is outside of the room just making sure that nobody physically went into the room. And then the idea is that people have to leave the body from the ballroom, go into this other room, see the image. The image is picked at random and nobody knows what the image is, so it's a double blind experiment. And then people have to come back, describe what they saw, and then all of these papers go to the auditor who signs that he you know, received all the papers before opening the door, and then you go, you open the door, and you check the results. Yeah? I am not the main researcher in charge of this. I know that we have had certainly already many hits, and we have done this, uh, this research you know, in, in many countries, really. Actually, it happened here in, Los in, in California, in Los Angeles, where I'm at, maybe about two or three years ago, but we've done it already in... Rio de Janeiro, Madrid, uh, London, Portugal, et cetera, in our own campus, et cetera, et cetera. I myself, the last time that we did it, usually I'm part of the staff and uh, I don't have the opportunity to participate in the research, but I had the opportunity that time. I lied down and I was able to see the image correctly in the computer. So that was one of the, I think, two or three times in several times that I have participated in this uh, endeavor that I have I, I was able, you know, to actually lie down and participate. Now, um, what is interesting about this is that, you know, the participants, they have not seen the images before. So basically the possibility or the probability of hitting the right image, which could be anything, you know, from a picture of a pointer to a cartoon character to Goofy to a landscape in Hawaii, etc. really the possibilities of just simply guessing it, you know, are you know, very hard to compute and basically limitless to a certain extent. So we certainly have already done this quite a bit and there is a, a paper that is upcoming, you know, that is going to present all of this uh, research. Now, the second one here is the bioenergy effects on uh, functional MRIs, which uh, basically what, uh, th there is this technique, let me see if I can advance this here. There is this technique that helps a lot for developing, I'm gonna go back in a second, for developing the ability to have out-of-body experiences, but also for training this energetic, energetic or etheric body that uh, we call it, you know, the VILO to reach the vibrational state. Probably some of you here, I don't know how many, that um, maybe have dabbled in out-of-body experiences or maybe in the middle of the night, sometimes might have been woken up by these strange vibrations in the middle of the night. And the VILO basically is a technique that induces this vibration which normally promotes the out-of-body experiences in individuals. So what we have tried to do is as much as we can to try to see what are the attributes that can be measured in the vibrational state to try to code them, to try to develop a methodology for, again, developing this in individuals. 
And part of the results is that we put this a little bit to the test on functional MRIs. I don't have all the data, but some of the things that were shown is that as the person who has already developed his own capacities, in this case, this colleague of ours, Wagner Allegretti, so as the person has already developed its own capacity, so the first person perspective, the person can be put in the functional MRI, and when they start to do this energetic technique, the functional MRI starts to perceive, you know, um, or starts to register things even outside of the physical body. The doctor, actually, the friend of ours that was there in the, how could I say, in the room, when he started to see that, he, he thought, look, this is impossible. Now you don't need a doctor, you need a physicist to explain here how the functional MRI can perceive something that is outside of the physical body. So anyways, maybe Wagner actually on the next SSC conference, he can already present this paper and show you with more detail, you know, the, the results. But anyway, this is just for you to see the, the third person perspective. Now, going into the second and the first person perspective, as I was saying, one of the things that we try to do the, the best we can is actually to develop techniques, to develop not just energetic techniques, but also techniques for having out-of-party experiences and teaching these to people. And we have had a, a lot of success. In my case, I've, I've uh, probably been lecturing and giving classes you know, for about 20 years all over the world. I had the, the fortune of learning a few languages, so Europe, Australia, South America, uh, Portuguese, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, we have already you know, taught a lot of people how to have the out-of-party experience. So this, again, is something that can be developed. Now, uh, what, to a certain extent, does this lead us to? You see if I can cut a little bit. First of all, just trying to understand here what, the, what we see in terms of evidence and in terms of the paradigm. You know, the current conventional paradigm, or the leading, I guess, for many people, I know that probably not for most of the people here, is that consciousness is a product of matter and energy. It's to a certain extent a product of the chemistry and the biology. What we see, especially when we have an out-of-party experience, is that consciousness seems to be a completely separate entity that can affect you know, matter and energy. And um, I don't know how many of you, so let me see if I can talk here a little bit more about the OBEs and maybe even put this a little bit to the test you know, in terms of us trying to embrace a little bit the idea of, let me see if I can go back, the idea of diving into the subjective and um, really, what am I gonna say? Really trying to embrace the participative research and us being part of the, of the guinea pigs. I don't know how many people here maybe have already had that of party experiences. I know maybe for many people here, probably this sounds, how could I say, out of this world, you know, what is happening here, what, what is occurring, you know, what type of a presentation is this? What happens, of course, is the following. I know all the conventional theories, and later on, if you, if you wish, you can ask me about conventional theories on trying to explain out-of-party experiences because of lack of oxygen, A, B, C, D. The thing is that it's very different when you have it. One thing is, you know, when you're just simply reading something theoretically, another thing is when you are actually having the experience and you realize this has nothing to do with lack of oxygen. This has nothing to do with A, B, C, D. And when you have a conscious, fully aware, out-of-body experience, you are outside your body, aware, with all of your reasoning, with all of your memories, with all of your consciousness, with all of your logic. You remember everything that you studied in school without any problem. Even this is a very different condition from dreams, uh, something that I many times, uh, or even lucid dreams, many times I put as a difference is, you know, how many times in dreams have we remembered, for example, our phone number? or our address, and outside the body, you can do this. You certainly remember everything. You remember whether you skip dinner or not. So you are completely you. But again, the interesting thing, and part, I guess, of what I am trying to help us all here to think is, one thing is the theory that is out there. Another thing is the moment that we experience that, because that completely changes our paradigm. So to a certain extent, you know, trying to think about uh, what would happen if we experienced a near-death experience or an out-of-body experience, how would that shift or change our perspective? Because notice how it's interesting to analyze something that is external to us. 
certainly is very interesting. But besides that, it's interesting to consider what would happen if this happens to me. So again, I don't know what is the extent of the out-of-party experiences here, but sort of like trying to help us to embrace this idea of us being the guinea pigs and us being, how could I say, the, the researchers to a certain extent or, you know, doing the subjective research. And as I describe the following scenario, try to think what goes through your mind. You know, if you embrace this, if you, how could I say, try to debunk it, if you try to run out the door, you know, uh, if you try to f deny it or to find some psychological filter to just simply get out of this simple intellectual exercise that I'm going to do with you. So let's assume that we all have an out of party experience tonight. And I don't know, again, what is the extent of your out-of-party experiences. But then you happen to be tonight in this position, just simply outside your body, with all of your awareness and the same level of knowledge that you have right now, looking at your physical body, lying in bed, sleeping. What is the reaction? This is interesting to consider. Again, analyze yourselves because, you know, I know that we have here a lot of very... Uh, how could I say, leading thinkers of the world, and I've heard this many times, which I agree with, you know, uh, uh, from here many times we can help to shape the trajectory of science and, you know, how research is going to be done in the future, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that this is very valid, of course. I, I have enjoyed, you know, all the presentations that have uh, occurred here and have been taking notes of many of them, of course. But then we can also start to consider this condition because depending on the, how could I say, the filter that we put in these ideas, this is going to limit or expand the embracing of participative research. Does, does this make sense? Yes? So um, this is an interesting just mental exercise, I guess, to go through it much more interesting is to have this condition in the practice, not just in the theory. One thing again is the, the theory, another thing is the practice. I can tell you in my case, I started having them since I was 12, I didn't know what they were. I didn't, I, certainly my, my education didn't prepare me for this at all. I just simply knew that I was floating in my bedroom, in my house, you know, very, very aware, and with time, is that I realized that not everybody was having this. And it was much later on that I started finding books and reading about the subject. So it had nothing to do with, how could I say, having had an influence, you know, an external influence from this. And like this, I know, you know, hundreds of people in this situation. So, um, you know, again, the, the condition of these different types of, of uh, models for approaching, you know, and studying here the consciousness. Now, let me see if there was something else I wanted to mention here. Of course, the projection of the consciousness or the out-of-body experience has been known by many names, and just to help you to associate some ideas here, the most common one is the spontaneous one, when the person in the middle of the night just regains its awareness and is floating there close to the ceiling or close to where the person sleeps, like, you know, the other picture that you saw there. There is also the forced out-of-body experience, which is where the near-death experience mainly fits. So the person clinically dies for a few minutes, and then in many cases of near-death experiences, the person finds itself, you know, outside the body, going through a tunnel, meeting deceased relatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Something, by the way, that we observe as well. Afterwards, you know, I, I knew that I wasn't gonna have more, more time, but afterwards, feel free to ask me about my experiences, because I have had many of them, indeed. And, um, and as well, you know, the one that we're trying to hopefully start to make a little bit more common is the one where people are able to provoke it at will. Certainly this one as well. Now, notice that in talking about the out-of-body experiences, something that Chantal was mentioning here at the beginning, I am a chemist. So my background is certainly in conventional science, even though, by the way, I don't know if Mr. Sky Nelson is still around, but, you know, it took me a quite an effort to try to follow your lecture, you know, because these were things that I had, hadn't revisited in a while, but I did understand it, okay? It almost seemed like having a recollection of a past life, <laughs> simply because I had studied those things, you know, a while ago in college, but still I followed it. But what I'm trying to say here is that just because we have these experiences and we're able to produce them, 
it doesn't necessarily mean that we need to lose, again, our logic or our reasoning. So we don't necessarily need to be afraid of the, you know, these types of experiences. Part of what is interesting is that sometimes, you know, um, I've seen certain people that have this type of, um, of a thought or of a, be or of a behavior to a certain extent. Probably it's not the case of any one of you here, but it's almost like, let's embrace participative research. So let me study your participative research, not mine, but to a certain extent to embrace subjective participative research, we also have to be able to see ourselves as the guinea pigs. You, you understand what I mean? So this is uh, you know, part of it. Now, uh, there are many benefits to the out-of-party experience. I wish I had here you know, an entire hour to describe them. Many of them, of course, are uh, benefits that you also see with people who have near-death experiences. The, um, you know, losing the fear of death, understanding better what they should do with their life, um, you know, assistance to others, certainly, sometimes recollections of past lives while we are in an out-of-party experience. So not just in the physical condition, but also while we are in an out-of-party experience. Access to other dimensions, I wish I had a lot more time to talk about this. It's interesting how in physics, yes, the idea or the theory of other dimensions is accepted. But when you go and you perceive it straight on, somehow it's not accepted. You, you see a little bit there the, the condition. Now, there is a, there, just one more thing. <laughs> I knew I was gonna be pressed with time. There is one thing about the out-of-body experiences. We can leave the body and when we are in the physical body, and, sorry, when we are in the physical reality, there are different types of experiments that can be set up to provide evidence, hard evidence, that you are having an out-of-body experience. But one idea that I wanted to leave you with is, when you have out-of-party experiences, you rarely want to stay in the physical reality. You want to go to several other different planes of existences, and for those, simply, there is no physical proof that you can provide of non-physical realities. So the methodology certainly has to be different. Yeah, so, and those are certainly the most interesting, by far. Yeah, so thank you. <laughs> I just want to make a comment that I remember in 1994 when I met uh, Bob John and Brenda Dunn, the battle cry for the subjective science to really experience. And I think one of the things that we've seen this entire afternoon is how important it is to engage in the experiment oneself and have that personal experience. Um, so, um, thank you, Louis. We have one question oh, here. You. Yes, yes, please. Um, it's, it's not unusual for uh, ordinary, well-educated people to avoid uh, important and, and uh, very likely very adve uh, uh, great adventures. I've uh, done autopsies now for uh, 26 years, and I taught the re uh, residents in the LA area that uh, were working on their pathology. The medical students do autopsies on formalin bodies, and to get them to come see a fresh body where they can actually touch the organs and see what they're, uh, and have a tangible experience is like pulling teeth. It's harder than pulling teeth. They will not come. Yet, they talk as if they know anatomy. They can't know anatomy out of books. They have no tangible experience, and this is a widespread phenomenon. Yeah. Hi, Lewis. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, I know time's limited, but would you be willing to describe one of your more memorable out-of-body experiences? Yes, sure, of course, and you know, um, one that uh, many times I, li I like to tell just because it's easier for people to relate and to understand, but also there is verification of it, was one that happened with me about 15 years ago. My, I was living in Miami, Florida at that time, and my oldest sister lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and she was starting to participate in the classes that we give of uh, development of this skill. And I wanted sort of like to try to see if I could show her how this worked. And because we have a very personal connection, this doesn't work just with, with anybody, uh, any other participant or any other student, 
I was able that specific night that she had taken the first weekend of uh, training, I was able to leave my body, go to her place in Atlanta, and I was able to take her outside her body. And then she was already like predisposed because of that. We have what is called a joint projection, which by the way is interesting because you see how the experience is no longer just subjective because both people can come back, remember it, and then they can talk about it. And if we are, you know, the skeptical research, we can go and, you know, take the account of one and then go and confirm with the other one. So we, it starts to lose its fully subjective character. But anyways, we flew over Atlanta, over Georgia, for several minutes, actually. And I was uh, trying to, to ask her, because it was more than anything her experience, you know, what is it that you want to do? Where is it that you want to go? And something interesting also that caught my attention is how we have our mindset completely connected in the physical reality. Because she had, um, had somebody who had arrived at her place and had uh, replaced the carpet a few days, bef days before and probably was one of these individuals that doesn't have papers and had done a bad job and she hadn't been able to communicate with him. So the first thing that popped into her mind is I need to go find the, you know, the carpet layer. <laughs> and in my mind, I even said, look, are you sure? Because there are a lot of other things that we can do here, by the way. But she was, no, yes, because, and now she was already in the, in the track of thinking of uh, the complaint to a certain extent. Yes, because he, you know, still owes me this money and he has to do this. And I was like, okay, let's just go. Let's just, you know, go and try to, but as she kept on going with the track of complaining, I realized, and this is something that we see quite a bit in the out-of-party experiences, that when the person becomes too emotional, the person starts to lose its awareness and normally the experience ends and they go back to the body. So what ended up happening is that she lost her awareness and she ended up going back to the body and then, you know, once she went back to her body, I just went on on the rest of my OBE and went back. But the following morning, I called her and she had a complete recollection of the experience. You know, you did this, you did that, you asked me. She was even thinking, you know, how could I decide, you know, to go see the carpet layer instead of, you know, going and doing <laughs> and seeing other things. So um, this is, you know, just one of the experiences, certainly that uh, possibilities that we can have. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Luis, for sharing all this. I'm dying to know, have you been brain mapped, FMRI, MEGD, EEG'd? Me, no. No? No, I, I haven't, no. I certainly will be more than willing. <laughs> there, there is no you know, problem, but I can tell you, several of my colleagues have. It's just because my area and my research sometimes is on other things, but I wouldn't be averse to that. A scientific match made in heaven right here <laughs> in the last hour. We have time for one more question. Dale. Right. In the, uh, in the dream work community, <clears throat> we many times have shared, mutual, lucid dreams. And that sounds very much to what you're talking about when you're using the out-of-body terminology. And it can be very difficult to, to call it an OBE when you come into it from a lucid dream point of view, but does it really matter what we call it? Yes, but, uh, but I actually, when I was listening to your presentation, some of the experiences that you mentioned, I started thinking maybe some of those are a little bit more out-of-body experiences. Something that we, that we see is that when you are outside the body and outside to a certain extent, let me see if I can explain, explain it in this fashion, when we are outside the, the restriction of the physical body, we are more psychic. So the precognition works a lot better also when we're dreaming because of that and when we are a little bit disconnected. So I'm... I would be inclined to say that probably in several of your experiences, you were probably disconnected from the body and that's why they work uh, so well, you know, as, as far as what you were presenting. So it gave me certainly the same impression. Yeah. Let's give Lewis a really big hand of applause. Um.